Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Brian McClanahan, and to, uh, today we're going to talk about the Philadelphia Convention. So uh, this is a, a very important part of the constitutional process because, of course, this is where we get the Constitution. And uh, I'm going to go through some of the more important clauses that come out of the, of the Philadelphia Convention, some of the more important issues, some of the more important players in this particular process. So this is a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, this presentation will be second. Uh, in terms of my favorites, uh, the next one, ratification, would be my favorite of the entire uh, course. But um, this one's pretty good, too. And I think that if we understand the Constitution that came out of Philadelphia and a little bit of the history behind the Philadelphia Convention, it'll help uh, our overall general understanding of what the Constitution was, what it is, what it was supposed to do, and, uh, of course, how we're supposed to interpret it today. The ratification conventions are the most important part of this of this process, but... Uh, most people focus on this Philadelphia Convention to gain a particular understanding of the meaning of the Constitution, and so we'll look at that too. I, I think that you can get a general understanding of the Constitution from the Philadelphia Convention, but until you get those ratifying debates and the discussions that were held throughout the states on 1787 and 1788, it's really hard to have an overall picture for what the founding generation thought about the Constitution. Remember, the Philadelphia Convention uh, was only... Uh, coming up with a document that had no weight unless the rest of the states agreed to ratify it. So, without further ado, let's get started with the convention. Now, uh, this particular convention is often called the Constitutional Convention, but it wasn't called that in 1787. It was the Philadelphia Convention, following on the heels of the Annapolis Convention in 1786. Uh, so, it's not the Constitutional Convention until the Constitution is finally written and ratified that people actually call it that. But uh, when these delegates, these 55 delegates from 12 states met in uh, May of 1787, they weren't sure exactly what they were going to be doing, most of them. Now, I think that uh, Madison knew what he was going to be doing, and uh, perhaps Hamilton had a good idea, but of course Hamilton is going to leave the convention for a time. Uh, Madison was going to set the agenda, though. Now, most of the delegates, though, had no clue that Madison was planning something as radical as what we would get at least in the opening stages. So the convention is going to meet from 14 May 1787 to 17 September 1787. This is why we designate 17 September Constitution Day, because that's the day the Constitution was actually signed and voted on by state. And that's another thing you know, most people don't realize. It was the unanimous uh, consent of the states present, not individual delegates. In fact, some of the delegates refused to sign it uh, for various reasons. But... Um, uh, the Philadelphia Convention is going to write this Constitution that we call the United States Constitution today. And important members included people like James Madison and uh, George Mason, Edmund Randolph, Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, John Dickinson, Elbridge Gerry, uh, Robert Yates, Alexander Hamilton, William Richardson Davy, Hugh Williamson, uh, Governor Morris, Robert Morris, James Wilson, and John Rutledge, all from different states. You know, Madison, Mason, Randolph are from Virginia, Sherman from Connecticut, Ellsworth from Connecticut, uh, Dickinson from Delaware, uh, Gary from Massachusetts, Yates and Hamilton from New York, Davy and Williamson from North Carolina, Morris, the two Morrises, uh, James Wilson from Pennsylvania, and of course John Rutledge from South Carolina. So these were some of the best men in the colonies. Of course, Jefferson was not there, John Adams was not there, uh, George Washington, of course, is there, and so was uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and of course, big names, but you know, Washington presided over the convention, but really didn't add much to it until the very end of the convention. Uh, Franklin didn't do much except every now and then interject uh, with, of course, his uh, long years of wisdom. And people listened to him. They respected him, his advice. Uh, you know, Franklin and Washington were the two most respected men in the entire United States at the time, so they gave weight to the convention. Uh, Adams, of course, was away as an ambassador, uh, and so was Jefferson, so uh, they weren't uh, able to do anything uh, with the Philadelphia Convention, uh, though Adams was writing letters back and forth, so people knew what he thought about different parts of the convention, uh, but uh, writing this constitution, but uh, Adams wasn't part of it uh, personally, uh, at, at in attendance at the convention itself. And of course, this is a hot summer. You know, it's, it's said that uh, the, the Philadelphia Convention took place during one of the hottest summers in, in history in Philadelphia that anyone had recorded at that point. Uh, the windows were shut, you know, the windows were shuttered. Uh, this, this convention was held in secret. Uh, the only thing, the only way we know what happened is because James Madison and some of the other delegates actually took notes. Uh, of course, these notes were not released for years. You know, Madison's notes were not released until after he was dead. 
So uh, that was the 1830s, and uh, that's when people really started having an understanding for what this convention was trying to do, uh, the different proposals and different ideas that were floated during the convention. And once you start to figure that stuff out and the complete picture comes into focus, uh, Americans in the antebellum period start to have a different perspective on this convention. And this is why when I get to the commentaries, you start to see a surge in commentaries on the, uh, the Constitution itself in the 1830s. Uh, and also because uh, Eliot published his very famous uh, Eliot's Debates in that particular period of time, around there. And of course, so now we had uh, some of the debates that were surrounding the Constitution during the ratifying process. So 1830s is a really important time for our understanding of the Constitution. So uh, let's look at uh, some of the important things about the Philadelphia Convention and the Constitution in general. Now, uh, there's a common misconception about large state versus small state. And I address this also in the presentation on ratification. Uh, but really, what Elbridge Gerry called the individuals there was rats and anti-rats. You had two groups of people, the nationalists and the federalists. Uh, this really is not a large state versus small state issue. It's often put in that language because it minimizes uh, the problems that we have between large states and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, federalists and, and uh, nationalists. You know, the federalists would later be called the anti-federalists, uh, but they're real, the real federalists. And of course, the nationalists are people who want a strong national government, you know, talking about abolishing the states or at least minimizing the power of the states. Uh, the nationalists included people like James Madison, uh, James Wilson, Governor Morris, Alexander Hamilton. The federalists were people like Elbridge Gerry and, and John Rutledge and uh, John Dickinson, Roger Sherman, George Mason, uh, Robert Yates. These are the people that were trying to check this nationalist impulse, and that's very important to understand. These conservatives, because that's what they were, were saying, look, we don't want to scrap the nature of the government under the Articles of Confederation. We're not getting rid of that union. We want to keep that union. But if you get this national government, that's exactly what we're doing. We're scrapping the entire nature of the union. So that union, again, that phrase union, as I talked about in the presentation on the Articles of Confederation, as I mentioned in the presentation on ratification, the next presentation, that idea of union is so important. What kind of union are we going to have? Is it going to be a national government where all power is arrogated to the central authority? Or is it going to be a federal government where the states still have, still hold sway? Of course, the Constitution explicitly states these states are delegating authority to this general government. Uh, so that's essentially what we have. We keep the federal government. Now, the Senate is the one real federal feature of the Constitution, and we'll get into that. Uh, as I mentioned before, George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were also there. Of course, the first plan put forward is called the Virginia Plan. Usually it's called the Large State Plan because of the way that representation uh, was set up in this particular plan. But in reality, it's the National Plan. And that's what they're debating in the early days of the convention. So very quickly, uh, Madison presents this plan through uh, Edmund Randolph. Randolph pitches it to the convention. And then they talk about it and they debate it. So what did the Virginia Plan call for? Well, it was a nationalist framework. It had a bicameral national legislature, not a federal legislature, a national legislature, where representation in both houses was based on population. So what they've essentially done here is take the nature of the union, where every state had one vote in the Articles of Confederation. It was a federal union of independent states. What they've done is, in, is basically scrapped that entire process because now states like Delaware or South Carolina, or Maryland, or New Jersey, are going to have a much smaller role in this government, whereas states like Massachusetts and New York and, and Virginia, states with large populations, are going to have a much greater role. Now, that's why it's often called the large state plan, but again, what Madison is trying to do here is minimize the power of the states. He had problems in, in Virginia, for example, in his own state, with people like Patrick Henry, who he thought was really dictating the political uh, nature of Virginia, and uh, really uh, you know, uh, causing all kinds of problems in the state. And so he didn't want that to happen. He didn't want someone like John Hancock dominating Massachusetts or George Clinton dominating New York. There were strong factions in these states that he thought needed to be destroyed. And so you do that by consolidating power in a central government. It also included an executive branch where the executive was elected by the legislature, a judicial branch chosen by the legislature. This is a complete overhaul of the central government and designed to centralize authority. And again, I answer this question, why? Because Madison wanted to destroy these state factions. Uh, if you can't get your way in Pennsylvania or Virginia or Massachusetts, well, then you just go bigger, right? So Pennsylvania had problems with the Western faction in that state. Uh, people like John Jay had problems with the Clintons in New York. Uh, Jan John Hancock held tremendous power 
in Massachusetts. Patrick Henry, tremendous power in Virginia. So by crushing those factions, uh, you're able to centralize power. And Madison said this is the best way to have effective government. Um, I think we might disagree nowadays because the states, of course, by emasculating the states, which is eventually what happens. Now, they swore up and down this was not going to happen, of course, in the ratification process. But by emasculating the states, you've, you've created this big mess that we have in, in, in Washington today. Now, there was another nationalist plan. It was called Pinckney's Plan. Charles Pinckney of South Carolina proposed a constitution. And uh, the constitution started with a preamble that said, We the people of the states of, and he listed all the states. Just like, uh, essentially, under the Articles of Confederation, where they listed all the states, here we have them listed as well. And that was the preamble. That, that structure of the preamble was there until the final drafts. And the only reason they changed it in the final drafts is because they weren't necessarily certain every state was going to ratify this document. I mean, Rhode Island didn't even send a delegation. So if you list all the states out, we could have problems if all 13 states don't ratify the document. So uh, they truncated that. Governor Morris was responsible for that. But you truncated it because of that problem. Uh, not because the states were uh, you know, losing all their authority. So instead of saying, we the people of the states of, they said, we the people of the United States. And everyone understood what the United States meant. Much of the language of Pinckney's plan also found its way in the final draft of the Constitution. Uh, even though this was more of a nationalist plan, the states were still at the center of the document. Uh, it, this document did not create a national government. And because of that, you know, because Pinckney's plan, um, what, a lot of the language was inserted into the final Constitution, we can say, well, it's still a, you know, a federal type government. It's not a national government. So, the, the main debate now in the Philadelphia Convention was not, uh, you know, small state, large state. It's what kind of government are we going to have? We're going to have a national government or a federal government. And uh, so that's really what we should be focusing on in this entire process. Forget about this large state, small state designation. That's, that's hogwash. That's bunk. What we're looking at here is national versus federal. And if you look at it that way, and I, I've given talks on this before, and I've had people come up and tell me, they, they just swear I'm, I'm, I'm just so wrong. It's large state, small state. And I, you, you, have, <clears throat> you have to look at this thing as Madison trying to get rid of the power of the states. He's trying to consolidate power and a central authority. And basically, and that's what Hamilton wanted to do too. That's what all the nationalists want to do. James Wilson, I mean, you take your pick of these nationalists. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to minimize the power of these states. In fact, uh, Governor Morris had a very interesting quote. He said, The distinction between a federal and a national supreme government, the former being a mere compact resting on the good faith of the parties, the latter having a complete and compulsive operation. Okay, so now Governor Morris has said, what are we talking about here? If we have a federal government, it's a compact resting on the good faith of the parties. Hmm. So, think about that for a second. If we have a federal government, which is what everyone swore we had in 1787 and 1788, then Governor Morris is right admitted here that it's a compact resting on the good faith of the parties. But if we have a national government, then we have a complete and compulsive operation, meaning that these states are required as compulsive. You can force them to do things. But that's not what we have. We still have a federal government. That's how it was argued to the states. We never got rid of our federal government. Uh, we, we have a federal government. Of course, today we call it a national government. So, I mean, what changed? The Constitution never changed. It's just the way we look at the Constitution that's changed. And that has to do, of course, with Abraham Lincoln. But we have a federal government. So, if the United States Constitution maintained the federal compact of the Articles of Confederation, and it did because that's how it was argued, then submission to the Constitution is done in good faith and not compulsion. There you have an argument for secession or nullification. If the United States, and I'll say this again, if the United States government, Constitution maintained the federal compact of the Articles of Confederation, and this is how it was argued, and it did, then submission to the Constitution is done in good faith and not compulsion. When you get in arguments with your friends about, you know, well, where is secession? I don't see in this Constitution where we can secede. I know that, you know, Liberty Classroom has had a number of discussion threads about this. Well, there's nothing there that says to concede. I've got a lawyer friend from Harvard. I've got a lawyer friend from Princeton. I've got a lawyer friend from Yale. 
I've got a lawyer friend from What's the Matter You, and this lawyer friend says that I'm just I'm just an idiot. I know nothing about contract law. I know nothing about government because they went to law school, so they know everything, and I'm just a complete dunderhead who knows nothing. I mean, granted, I, I you know I might have read you know dozens of books on the Constitution. I might have even looked at the ratifying debates. I've looked at these things, but I know nothing because I didn't go get a a JD from some big Ivy League school or even some you know small school. I don't have that JD beside my name, so I know nothing, right? Well, here you have it. I'm giving you a quote. You can go back to him and say, well, this is what Governor Morris said, and I think Governor Morris knows something about the Constitution because <laughs> he was in Philadelphia when the thing was written, and not only that, uh, you know, he was a big proponent of uh, the Constitution, and uh, this is what he said. Governor Morris, at the end of the convention, was ensuring people this maintained the federal government. So if it did, then submission to the Constitution is done in good faith and not compulsion. You can't force the states to do anything. Still, under the Constitution. Now, uh, after this uh, Virginia plan is debated, William Patterson of New Jersey will come up with another plan. Now, what the main problem that some of these states had, like New Jersey, is that, look, they said, hey, we're not sure if we even have authority to be doing this. It, we're not following the rules of the Articles of Confederation here. Uh, so can we really write a new constitution? Or, or We're just here to modify the articles. That's all we were charged with doing. That's all the state of New Jersey said we can do, is modify the Articles of Confederation. So he presents a plan, which is a modification of the articles. So now we have the quote-unquote small state plan. No, this is a federal plan, <laughs> not a small state plan, just like the Virginia plan was a national plan. Uh, the Articles of Confederation is not a small state document. It's a federal document. So all they did was say, okay, we're going to keep the articles, but we're going to make some amendments to it to make it stronger. In fact, in some ways, Patterson's plan was stronger than the Madison plan, the Virginia plan. So uh, basically, uh, under, the, under Patterson's plan, the general government could tax and regulate trade, which they could not do under the articles. It created a plural executive without a veto. My gosh, how great would that have been? Of course, we'll, you know, to talk about this executive branch in a second, it created a judicial branch. But it also required compulsory obedience to the central authority, even by force, if necessary. So what Patterson is saying is, okay, we're going to keep this federal government, but we're going to make sure there's a clause in this Constitution that says we can, can, we can force you to obey with our laws if we have to with the military. Now, there's nothing like that in the Constitution. Uh, so Patterson even went one step further, saying we can actually coerce a state now, Oliver Ellsworth swore up and down in Connecticut when the uh, Constitution was going through the ratifying process that, no, you can never coerce a state. You can never send force in to coerce a state. We have to do that through the, through the uh, judicial branch. But you can never send force in to coerce a state. And actually, there's a part of the Constitution that says the only time the military can be sent into a state is on application of the state legislature. The states have to say, hey, we need the military. You can't just march into the state. Of course, George Washington is going to do it in the Whiskey Rebellion. But you can't just march into a state. It's crazy. So uh, this Patterson plan, of course, now the debate is, well, we're going to keep the articles, we're going to scrap the articles, what's going to happen? John Dickinson, at this point, from Delaware, one of the most important men in, in the founding period. Uh, in, in, uh, in two of my books, I have a little chapter on John Dickinson. I, if you don't know John Dickinson, you need to, you need to learn John Dickinson. And his writings are actually available for free on the web. So go out there, go find John Dickinson's writings, and go read this guy. Uh, go get Eliot's debates, or you know, and read the Philadelphia Convention, and read what John Dickinson said because this guy was wise, uh, you know, sagacious. So was Roger Sherman. Read him too. A lot of his stuff is out there for free too. I mean, that's that's the great thing about the internet. Uh, we have this resource that can just give us. You know, bullet after bullet after bullet attacking the other side. And they can't stand it most of the time. When we come back with them and say, well, uh, this is what John Dickinson said. Well, how do you, how do you read? Well, you know, well, we got Alexander Hamilton on our side. You know, we got John Marshall. They've got about two or three guys they keep leaning on all the time. Well, you know, the founding generation, they were nationalists because we got Alexander Hamilton. We got John Marshall. Uh, who else? Well, we got Hamilton. We got John Marshall. And we got Madison at times because this is what he said about, you know, I mean, so this is what he really meant. He didn't mean any of that stuff in 1798. You know, he really meant this stuff. Um, so go back and read some of these more important individuals. I mean, Alexander Hamilton, 
before he became Secretary of Treasury was really not that important. Uh, John Marshall, before he became Chief Justice, was really not that important. John Dickinson in 1787 was really important. Uh, Roger Sherman in 1787 was really important. So these guys were more important than Hamilton and Marshall ever hoped to be when the Constitution was being written and ratified. Now, John Dickinson said this, Experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us. So he's looking at these proposals and saying, Holy moly, what are you talking about here? We can't do this. We can't have this drastic change in government, this national government. It's going to destroy the Union. Uh, Dickinson was a moderate. He, he thought the innovations, as he called them, that's his word, they're innovations that the nationalists were trying to pursue uh, were going to destroy the Union. So uh, he wanted to maintain the federal elements of the Articles of Confederation while strengthening the general government. He thought, well, we need to strengthen the government. You know, there's some problems here. But we better not get rid of a federal government because that's going to destroy the Union. Nobody's going to go for that. Uh, the people won't support it. We're going to have a national government? That's crazy. Nobody, nobody's going to support a national government. Are the people of Massachusetts and South Carolina really going to get along very well in a national government? No, are, the, are the Quakers of Pennsylvania going to get along with uh, you know, the Virginians, the Cavaliers of Virginia? I mean, is that really going to happen? Uh, I mean, please. Uh, we have 13 distinct republics here. Thirteen different cultures in a lot of ways, or at least you know, at least four major cultures, uh, as I talk about in the U.S. History Survey course. Are all these people really going to get along? Do we really have an American nation? I don't think so. So, uh, what we're going to get, of course, is often called the Connecticut Compromise. This is not a compromise between large and small states. It's a compromise between a national and a federal government. So, Roger Sherman said this. He urged the equality of the votes, not so much as security for the small states, as for the state governments which could not be preserved unless they were represented and had a negative in the general government. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> well, uh, Roger Sherman's just trying to, uh, you know, keep the small states in power. No, Roger Sherman's trying to make sure the state governments had, have a negative in this government. How are they going to do that? Through the Senate. This was the compromise. The House is proportional representation. The Senate is equal representation. And that Senate wields a lot of power in this government. It still does. If they would just grow a backbone and stand up to the president, they could have a lot of power. But they don't. They're a rubber stamp now for the president. So the president, uh, you know, uh, nominates someone. Oh well, we're going to ask some, you know, really nice questions. So, are you really do you really believe in judicial activism? Uh, I, I bet you that I bet you when that was asked, you know, during the uh, Kagan nominating process. Do you, so you really believe in judicial activism? My gosh, you could have said, yes, in fact, I want to legislate from the, I want to write legislation from the bench. Forget this. I'm going to just say we need to abolish the legislature and judges need to write legislation. I bet she could have said something like that. And she still would have been, uh, you know, ratified and still confirmed, uh, and, and being put on the bench because the Senate doesn't care. You know, trees? Ah, oh, who cares? Let the president sign treaties. We don't need to sign. We don't need to rat, you know, agree to these treaties, ratify these treaties. It's crazy. We don't need to do that. You know, we don't need, you don't need your advice and consent. Just go ahead and do this stuff on your own. The Senate has abrogated its power. They just give it to the president. Uh, but the Senate has a lot of power, and that was, that was Roger Sherman's idea. The Senate needs a negative in the general government. The states need a negative in the general government. The states need a negative. So here again, Roger Sherman, the state's rights Connecticut are saying, we need a negative. Now, what were these innovations he's talking about? Well, Alexander Hamilton wanted an American king, senators for life, a strong central government, the abolition of the states. Those sound like some pretty drastic innovations. And, of course, he's going to backtrack on this later on and say, I never said that. John Lansing is going to say, oh, well, yeah, I think you did, Hamilton. Here, you said it on this day in the Philadelphia Convention. Oops. Uh, Wilson, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, supported every proposal to render the states powerless in the general government. That was an innovation, you know, including just directly electing the president. You know, forget about the states even playing a role in that with the electoral college. Just directly elect the guy. Who cares? Uh, Governor Morris, same thing with Wilson, generally supported every nationalist proposal and thought the states should be compelled to support the general government. So here, I already had the quote from Governor Morris, a federal and a national government. Now, of course, by the end of the convention, He's forced to accept a federal, a federal government, not a national government. But see, the thing is, this doesn't mean these people stop thinking this stuff. What they do is they get the Constitution, they sell it to the states like the used car salesman that they are, and then they go out there and sign a couple, you know, get a two-year warranty in the Bill of Rights, and then they just can't just undo all this stuff. 
go back on everything they said. It's almost like Bill Clinton saying you can't you can't trust somebody who's a liar. Uh, last time I checked, Bill Clinton lied about everything. So I mean, people forget so quickly in America what these people were doing and what they were saying. Oh well, you know, I changed my mind. Uh, I, I thought that in 1787, 1788, but now I, I'm going back to my nationalist position. Of course, nobody knew this stuff was going on in Philadelphia because nobody published their notes. If anyone had seen what Hamilton actually was, or Wilson, or Morris, they would have been frightened of these people. But they didn't know it, and Madison didn't publish these things. Uh, so you know, the American public was duped. They were hoodwinked, bamboozled by these individuals. Now, other compromises, of course, slavery, the Three-Fifths Compromise on uh, the international slave trade, that was a huge compromise. Of course, uh, uh, the North and the South are going to get together on this. And What's interesting about that is that the, the North didn't want to count slaves at all towards representation. The South did. They wanted to count slaves as a whole person. So there's all this misconception out there that the South, these evil Southerners, they didn't want to count slaves, just chattel, and they didn't think about anything. Well, they're saying, well, look, these people are rational beings. Uh, well, you can count women and children. Why can't we count slaves? We got to take care of them, and you want to tax them. So therefore, we should be able to count them because you want to tax them. You're going to you're going to raise taxes on us because of this. Uh, so we should have a, a, the ability to block those taxes by having more people in the government. Uh, so that was a compromise. Now you can count slaves as three fifths of a person towards representation. So the South is actually saying they're a whole person. The North is saying they're not anybody. Uh, we a lot of people don't realize that. But it's all about taxes. It's all about taxing power. Uh, of course, the international slave trade was extended till 1808. Uh, George Mason said, my gosh, this is disastrous. We don't want the international slave trade ex extended. That's crazy. Uh, because this is the worst part of slavery. But of course, you know, the North was fine with it. They're going to make a lot of money on it. Uh, some of the deep southern states were okay with it because they still wanted to import slaves. But again, uh, George Mason of Virginia, a very logical voice saying, this is, this is the worst part of slavery. We need to get rid of it. Uh, term lengths for president and Congress, um, you know, some people had talked about very long terms for president, others short, you know, Congress the same thing, and there were some pretty crazy proposals out there. You know, at one point people were talking about senators for life or 36-year terms, all these crazy things, and some of that was for, was for effect because they wanted to show, they don't want, to, they don't want a monarchy here, and eventually going to settle at four years for the president, two years for the House of Representatives, and six years for the Senate, and the reason being, in terms of these, you know, these they picked these years, you know, two years for the House, for example. Some people thought we needed yearly terms. But again, this is a general government. So because it's a general government, you don't need to have people acquainted with the minutia of the state uh, issues, you know, what's going on in Delaware, what's going on in Maryland or Pennsylvania or, you know, North Carolina or uh, Connecticut. It doesn't matter uh, because these people are doing what's in the best interest of the union, the union of the states. So commerce and defense, that's it. That's all they were really there to do. Uh, the taxing power was tied to the appointment of uh, apportionment, uh, excuse me, of representatives. Uh, so <clears throat> this was the three fifths compromise. Is what I mean by that. All kinds of interesting little things going on here, little give and take, back and forth, uh, to try to make sure that uh, the states uh, would uh, not be abused. The southern states were concerned that there would be some mercantile laws the North would be able to pass and. So they didn't want that to happen. In fact, there were proposals out there that if any you know tariff was going to be passed, it had to have a two-thirds majority and all kinds of things. So the South was actually cognizant in 1787 and uh, in the early uh, late 18th century, I should say, early 19th century, that they could be killed by the North uh, because of this disproportionate population and the fact that the North was going to hold sway oftentimes uh, in the Congress. Now, what about the sweeping clauses? So you're, going to, you're going to hear that phrase a lot, the sweeping clauses. Uh, when we talk about the sweeping clauses, at least in today, you're looking at the general welfare clause, the commerce clause, the necessary and proper clause, and the supremacy clause. And let me look at, let me go through these just very quickly, uh, the, these top four here. Uh, the general welfare clause was lifted directly from the Articles of Confederation. So this was, and I talked about this in that presentation, so I don't really need to go over it much again, but this was for the general welfare of the Union, which Roger Sherman, who lifted the phrase, said this is commerce and defense. So the idea that the general welfare clause can, can provide, you know, health care or welfare. I mean, I actually just saw a piece not long ago uh, where they had a, it was a political cartoon and, you know, they had this poor, the poor people riding in the bus with the general welfare on top of it. And, of course, all these neo-confederates out there running it off the road. I mean, because they think general welfare means they can have, you know, help, they can have food stamps. I mean, this is so ridiculous. That's not the general welfare of the union. That's the general welfare of a portion of the population. I have to, on the same token... The general welfare doesn't mean we can have corporate welfare. 
Uh, and so the government can go out and, you know, basically get in bed with, with corporations and, uh, provide, you know, whether it's, uh, high protective tariffs or, uh, you know, easy corporate laws or, you know, whatever the case may have, have crony capitalism, which is what that is in you know, the phrase, Hamiltonianism, that's not general welfare either. That's not helping out the states, it's helping individuals. So it works both ways. Uh, and, you know, the left won't realize that it works, you know, that they're, they're more than happy to criticize corporate welfare, but they don't want to, Criticize, you know, welfare for poor people, which is completely unconstitutional. And then neoconservatives often like to push in Hamiltonians, you know, corporate welfare. Oh, that's great, but we don't give, you know, the other thing is unconstitutional. They're both unconstitutional, and that's how we should look at it. Uh, the Commerce Clause, of course, this was to regulate interstate commerce with foreign nations and with the Indian tribes. It says nothing about intrastate commerce because that was never even on the table. Uh, if anyone thought that was on the table, they never would ratify the Constitution. So if I produce an item, let's say I produce, you know, a ties and uh, I sell them only in the state of Alabama where I live, well then I should not be subjected to any federal regulations whatsoever on my production of ties. If I sell these ties into Georgia, well then that's another thing. Now see what's happened though, it's a really interesting caveat to this. What's happened is that uh, the Supreme Court has said, well, individuals are commerce. So because somebody from Georgia could buy one of my ties in Alabama and take it back over to Georgia, well, that's interstate commerce. I mean, you, it's so stupid. Or because somebody can go into a restaurant and they might be from out of town, but yet they're in some podunk town in Alabama and they might buy some food there. Well, that's interstate commerce. This is how stupid it's gotten. But that's not what was intended. Uh, and so the Commerce Clause is just completely abused. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons why we have some of the legislation we have, because they go out there and say, well, it's, we're regulating commerce, uh, whatever that means. Uh, and, of course, John Marshall is going to be involved in this, you know, with the Gibbons v. Ogden case, even though he did say in that particular case you can't regulate intrastate commerce. But he is saying the government can regulate just about anything they want to in terms of interstate commerce. Uh, so and what they're talking about here basically was four nations. And the idea of regulate in the 18th century meant keep, freight, keep trade free. No tariffs, you know, just have free exchange. I should be able to buy anything I want at any time I want, you know, so I should be able to import things from the state of Virginia if I want to. Uh, but, you know, that's interstate commerce. The necessary and proper clause, I get into this more when we start talking about uh, the issue with Jefferson and, and uh, Hamilton and the Bank of the United States and how uh, that, that particular clause was just abused by Alexander Hamilton. I mean, just in ways that are so funny, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, you know, sad. Uh, you know, saying absolutely necessary. You know, yeah, necessary means you can't say strictly necessary. If you wanted to, uh, you know, you can't, you don't have a, tr a qualifier, absolutely necessary. That would be like strictly necessary. You can't do that. So necessary is broad. You can imply what that means. You know, absolutely necessary would be something different. That's like saying that expressly delegated is different than delegated. No, delegated means you delegate it. And, and you're delegating that particular power that you're saying. Nothing else. Just like necessary and proper, that means whatever's necessary, absolutely necessary and necessary, the same exact thing. Expressly delegated and delegated, same exact thing. The meaning doesn't change. Now, of course, uh, you know, expressly delegated was, we're talking about the Tenth Amendment, was in uh, the Articles of Confederation, that phrase. And, of course, the Tenth Amendment just says delegated, but carried the same meaning, as everyone said in 1791 when the amendment was being ratified. Uh, the Supremacy Clause, again, one of the most abused clauses of the Constitution, uh, all laws which are made in pursuance of the Constitution and treaties are supreme law of the land, but they have to be made in pursuance of the Constitution. You know, if, if you want to get into this in more detail, I talk about all these particular clauses uh, in my book, The Founding Fathers' Guide to the Constitution, and I go through and give you quote after quote after quote from these, uh, from from the from the Philadelphia Convention, from the ratifying conventions, and what they actually meant by these things. Even Hamilton saying that you can't. The you know, supremacy clause is not going to uh, uh, abuse the states because, again, everything's made in pursuance of the Constitution. It was a law that's not in pursuance of the Constitution. It's no law. Hamilton himself actually said that. And that's how everybody thought of it. Well, I mean, so if it's, it's, if it's obviously an unconstitutional law, then it's not supreme. I mean, the, the Articles of Confederation had something like this, too. It just wasn't in that exact language, but it had the same thing. Uh, so what we've got here, though, what, what's happened over time is we reduced the Constitution to a series of clauses. This is ridiculous. If you look up, actually, in LewRockwell.com, Lawrence Vance, who writes extensively for Lou Rockwell, uh, had a piece on that. You're reducing the Constitution to a bunch of stupid clauses, and that's what we've done. Well, we have this clause and this clause and this clause. It's so stupid. We, we, we don't look at the Constitution in its entirety, how it was ratified, what people meant. 
uh, as a whole. So, uh, you know, if we're going to do that, then yeah, sure, we'll take these clauses out and we'll break them out. We're still going to be proven correct. Now again, 17 September 1787 is the day the Constitution was approved in Philadelphia, but it was nothing more than a scrap of paper. It had not been ratified. In fact, George Mason said he'd rather cut off his right hand than sign it. There was no Bill of Rights. Uh, the representative ratio uh, was discussed on the final day, and let me talk about that in a minute. But uh, you know, so there were there were delegates. You know, Gary uh, Randolph himself actually didn't sign the Constitution. Then he later became a firm proponent of it. But Mason didn't sign it. Uh, so this thing had some problems, and people recognized it. But they said, well, this is the best we could do. You know, Benjamin Franklin thought it wasn't perfect, but this is the best we could come up with uh, to make sure that everyone was going to be happy. Well, we know what, it's, what, what you get when you try to make everyone happy. No one's happy. So uh, I think ultimately, you know, that's, the Constitution is just a series of blundering compromises in so many ways that causes all kinds of problems. Now, representative ratio. This is a really interesting argument. Uh, on the last couple of days, you know, uh, actually the last day, George Washington looked at it and said, well, look, we have a 40,000 to 1 ratio in the House of Representatives. That's too high. Uh, there's no way that uh, a person can accurately represent the people at 40,000 to 1. So we need to drop that down. So they, they dropped it down to 30,000 to 1. Now, that even was, some people in Massachusetts, for example, thought that was too high. So the argument was, well, if it's a general government, the, the, you don't need to have really, uh, you know, th this uh, close representation. 30,000 to 1 would work. We're sitting now at almost 800,000 to 1. So if George Washington thought 40,001 was too high, my gosh, what would he think today? Now, of course, we'd have to have 10,000 members of the House of Representatives. That wouldn't work. So the only solution in this, in this large, large you know, United States' conglomeration that we have today, the only solution for this is decentralization. It's returning more power to the states because if you look at the state governments, they're more responsive to the people because of that representative ratio. There are as many people today in the state of Alabama as in the entire United States in 1790. So we've gotten this thing way out of whack. Uh, the only way to do it is through decentralization. Nine states were needed to ratify, and voting was by state at the convention, not by individuals. So again, they're recognizing every single time that states are going to be uh, important. Now, uh, what kind of government are we going to have? Well, it's argued we have a federal constitution rather than a national constitution. That's what they said it was. So if that's the case, then, of course, Governor Morris, going back to that quote, he said the states cannot, cannot be compelled. This is not compulsory obedience. Uh, they, they, have to, they have to basically grant that they'll concede to the document. And at times, of course, if you delegate authority, you, you have that authority. You never give up your sovereignty. Uh, Madison, of course, is not getting the Constitution he wanted. He's forced to defend a document he didn't want in May, so he has to swallow his pride there. And, of course, the founders thought that the, uh, the framers at this point, and, of course, the founding generation, thought the legislative branch would have the most power, not the executive. And, of course, the states would still have a tremendous amount of power in this government. So vis-a-vis -vis the general government, they still had a lot of it, particularly with the Senate. The Senate was going to be that federal check on the entire apparatus. You know, they, they, they have power over the president and appointment powers, uh, you know, confirmation powers in terms of treaties. Uh, they can check the House of Representatives. So the Senate, the states, have all this power in the government. So the Senate itself was supposed to be, in so many ways, uh, the most powerful branch of government. Uh, judicial review, not necessarily in the document. There's a lot of debate about this. And when we get to the presentation on uh, Marbury, uh, I'm sorry, John Marshall and the Marbury v. Madison case, I, I talk about this a little more in detail. Uh, the executive powers were very vague. Uh, so uh, they were, they've been abused like crazy. Uh, even George Washington abused them with the Whiskey Rebellion. So from the very beginning, executive powers are going to be abused. Uh, but, uh, you know, people trusted George Washington that they just weren't far-seeing enough that uh, we're going to get disasters very quickly after that. Uh, Washington was a good man, a great man, and uh, people trusted uh, trusted the uh, the American Cincinnatus, but uh, John Adams, not so much. Thomas Jefferson had his detractors. I mean, even the founding generation. Then you get people like Andrew Jackson. I mean, my gosh, you know, John Quincy Adams, disasters. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> you know, my gosh, give me a break. Uh, you know, terrible people. Uh, and then in the 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt, William McKinley, of course, late 19th. William McKinley, uh, you know, you've got uh, all the progressives, Woodrow Wilson and Taft, and, you know, it's just one disaster after another. You know, Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Truman, and, I mean, my gosh, you, uh, you can go down the line. So executive, the executive branch is really the problem in the entire Constitution, which is why that plural executive sounds so attractive. Now, without a veto, the president couldn't have vetoed any legislation, 
and it was a three-headed monster, so to speak. Now, the reason that they didn't go for that is because they wanted to have, you know, accountability, and they thought one individual would be accountable. Three could maybe not be, but, um, you know, who's to say we needed an executive? That was always debatable. So, anyways, there's a lot of interesting things about the Constitution. I, I recommend, if you've never read it, and I'm sure a lot of you have, but if you never have, go out and pick it up. And, uh... Uh, look at the book, you know, look at my Founding Fathers Guide to the Constitution, because I break it out. Look, read Dr. Gutzman's The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. Both very easy, readable books on the document. Uh, when we get to the, uh, presentation on the, the antebellum commentaries, go out and pick up some of these commentaries and look at them and read them. They're all free, available for free on the web, so pick them up and read them. Uh, look at these things, because it'll help you have a better understanding of what the founding generation and then that second generation said about the Constitution. And those are the generations we should pay attention to. I mean, ultimately, uh, who cares what, you know, some law professor says nowadays or, you know, some law professor masquerading as a president, you know, what he says. And so uh, these people don't don't matter in reality and what they mean, because they've been so duped and so destroyed by uh, these uh, nationalist arguments that uh, you know, whatever they say doesn't matter. So anyways, uh, 